A heart transplant is a life-changing event. The world is now my oyster, from the bottom to the top. But for a few, it brings much more. I absolutely do not believe for a second that a heart is just a pump. Little by little, many things started happening. I was more of an Italian food fan, but I love Mexican food now. Suddenly, like green peppers, putting them in my food, I used to take them out. I just was writing and writing and writing. I didn't have a clue where it was coming from. I was convinced that I was living with the presence of another within me. It's like two people in one body. Is it possible that a new heart could bring with it the memories of a donor? This idea of a sentient, remembering, connecting heart is one of the most radical scientific concepts to come along in a very long time, and it changes everything. With strict codes of confidentiality in place at the hospital, it was impossible for Claire to have known these details about her donor. So where could these memories have come from? Professor Paul Pearsall is a cardioneurologist from the University of Honolulu. He first encountered stories like Claire's whilst recovering in hospital from a bone marrow transplant. I had a bone marrow transplant for stage four cancer in the very early 80s. And I was on the transplant unit and we would sit down at night, all of us who were dying, and most of us were, and talk about things. And the heart transplant recipients were reporting, receiving the memories, feelings, food preferences, fears, musical preferences of their donor. One woman who got the heart of a boxer was the most quiet, demure, easygoing woman, hated violence, left the room when her husband would watch football. Got this heart of the boxer, now she watches football and yells and swears and, and punches and everything. So that's when I started hearing all these remarkable stories. And I, I started to collect every single one I could. Could the transplanted heart be bringing with it some kind of information from its previous owner? We know that the heart is a hugely energetic organ and is in constant communication with the brain. 40,000 neurons, or nerve cells in the heart, communicate up to the brain. Hormones from the heart travel in our bloodstream, and every time the heart beats, it creates a pulse wave. But most impressive of all is our heart's magnetic energy, 5,000 times more powerful than the brain. It can be measured up to six feet away from our bodies. I thought, this heart is just as powerful, more powerful, and does talk to the brain. Maybe we should be paying attention to that. Maybe the brain, even though it thinks it's us, isn't. Professor Pearsall was sure that the energy of the heart and its relationship with the brain was the key. And as more and more transplant patients came up with these remarkable experiences, it seemed to confirm it. But could his hunch stand up to science? The heart is a connective organ, a gentle organ. It's a different type of intelligence. I don't know all about its intelligence. That's what we need to learn. And how we learn that is by asking openly questions about people's hearts, not dismissing them as poetry, that metaphor, say maybe there's something to this. Professor Pearsall collated his research into a book called The Heart's Code. In it, he explored these stories about organ transplant patients and what they reveal about where we store our memories. Simultaneously, on the opposite side of America, Professor of Psychology and Psychiatry from Yale University, Gary Schwartz, was developing a new theory of how memory could work. I was studying how feedback mechanisms are involved in learning. When we talk, for example, about how the brain learns, we talk about what are called neural networks in the brain, it turns out that the way a neural network works is that the output of the neurons feed back to the input of the neurons. And this process goes over and over again. And so long as the feedback is present, the neurons will learn. If you cut the feedback, there is no learning in the neurons. And the implication is that it's important for the neurons to have the feedback in order for the learning to take place. 
Well, by extension, any system that has feedback is going to therefore learn. I mean, we learn to shoot baskets, for example, in basketball by getting feedback about whether we're accurate or not. We learn to speak by getting feedback about whether we're accurate or not. And so consequently, any system, any set of cells that has feedback mechanisms in a network is going to learn the same way that neurons learn. And that's what's called feedback memory or systemic memory. He applied his theory of feedback memory to the heart and predicted that information could be transferred through organs in transplant surgery. At around the same time, cases like Claire Sylvia hit the headlines. And Professor Pearsall published numerous similar stories from transplant patients. The two men realized their common ground and got in touch with each other. We spoke to each other on the telephone, and as I began to hear more of details about the cases, I began to realize that this was a theoretical prediction that could actually be verified in the biomedical world. I told Paul that I felt it was very important that some of his best cases be looked at very carefully and that they be published in a journal article. I collected and did the interviews and did the transcripts and the analysis of the transcripts and had got all the transcripts together and then sent them to Dr. Schwartz. They had to trace and interview not only the heart recipients, but also the donor families. What they were looking for were parallels between donor and recipient in their preferences, memories and tastes. I independently examined those cases, had them blindly looked at by other individuals and then wrote a formal research report that describing those cases and giving the kinds of examples of data that are sort of irrefutable. If you look at the content carefully, you will discover that the degree of coincidence is too detailed. For example, there's a case that we describe of a man 47 years old and he received the heart of a 17-year-old black young man. And he was not racist, but he had a lot of biases about what he expected of young black men, including the fact that if he was going to pick up anything from them, he would be afraid, for example, that he might be picking up rap music. However, after he received the transplant of the various changes that he experienced, is he had a profound change uh, in his preference for music. He became obsessed with classical music. He began listening to it over and over. He began singing melodies, uh, uh, classical melodies to songs he hadn't heard. His wife was thoroughly confused. Only later was it learned that the young boy was actually leaving his violin lessons because he was a classical violinist and he was hit by a car. That kind of information is not the kind of information that you just get with a random assortment of fears or changes in simple preferences. The stories they were collecting seemed to contain remarkable parallels. It seemed to Schwartz that the information relayed by the recipient could only have come from their new heart. To the extent that the heart is serving as a circulating feedback storage system for core central memories in the body, then if that heart is taken out and placed in another body, those core central memories, which are circulating within the heart, in its cellular and neural feedback loops, would continue and be passed on in the new person. Jim is one of those patients who experienced an extraordinary change directly after his operation five years ago. Well, I left school when I was 15. I was a coalman and in a lorry driver, room, so I didn't have a very good e education. Um, but I learned myself how to write, and I'm not very good at spelling. So it was a surprise to me that six months after my transplant, I was just sat down one morning and just scribbled something down and then that led to many poems and me book what I'm writing. I just was writing and writing and writing and that's how it came about, like, you know, and uh, 
I don't know where it come from, to be honest with you, because like I say, I've never done anything like this before. I'm sending you a thousand kisses. Before his transplant, Jim had no creative talent for writing and very little time for sentimentality. Never ever wrote anything before in my life. Never even sent her a love letter in 42 years. Have I? Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Some scientists now think they've found a system of neurons in the heart that challenges the orthodox view of the brain. Until the recent past, science has glorified the brain. The questions we should be asking as scientists is, is that the only place these things happen? When we just know about the heart and its remarkable energy and its connections with the brain and its neurons and its hormones, if we know that, shouldn't we be asking is, and here comes the key scientific question, is there another source of intelligence? Is there another way to think? Not instead, but also. The question isn't either or. The question is and. And if we only glorify the brain, we'll never be open to the possibility that another organ thinks. Researchers at the Institute of Heart Math in California are investigating the possibility that the heart could actually have its own unique intelligence. Dr. Roland McCrady and his colleagues have developed experiments to see whether the metaphors of the heart could stand up to scientific scrutiny. I first heard of Paul Pearsall when I think he contacted me in terms of exploring possible mechanisms that might explain the, the phenomena of a, a heart transplant recipient taking on some of the personality characteristics of the person that they got the heart from. He had interviewed quite a number of patients that had this experience, and there's enough of this that I think we have to take it seriously, that there is something going on here. Dr. McCready's research is controversial, but he found support in evidence provided by a neurologist, Dr. Andrew Amour, from Montreal in Canada. After many years treating patients with heart disease, he observed there was more to the heart than the current scientific model could explain. In those days, in the 60s, there was no consideration of the nervous system. The heart was just a pump. And the reason is because people have not had the facility to see the heart in any other form. You look at it and it's a pump, right? And my own bias is that in the last 50 years or so, we have developed the ability with all the electronics to record more than just the muscle on the heart, but the neurons on the heart. As he looked closer, he noticed something remarkable. I started to record outside the heart and found neurons that no one had expected before. And I thought, gee, that's sort of nice. I wonder if that could be on the heart, right? So from there, and having developed techniques that I felt good about, I put them on a heart and bingo, they worked. He had discovered a sophisticated collection of neurons in the heart. According to him, they were organized into a small but complex nervous system. He called it the little brain in the heart. Suddenly, our traditional views on the brain and intelligence were being challenged. If the heart had brain cells, could it have its own unique type of intelligence? The researchers at HeartMath believe so. They call it heart intelligence. The heart itself has a, a quite complex nervous system. And all the types of neurons and the way they're wired together to, to be able to say that the heart has a functional brain. And Dr. Armour has pictures of it. I mean, it's, there's definitely a little brain in the heart. And the types of neurons that are in the little brain in the heart have also been demonstrated to have both short and long-term memory using the same type of techniques that you use to show that neurons in the brain exhibit memory. This little collection of neurons can retain input function for a little while. So if your heart beats, puts it in, this little guy is still oscillating. So the last cardiac cycle could set up a number of future cardiac cycles. That's memory. Once a heart is removed from the donor, it is cooled and can stay alive for up to four hours. Heart's 
in the room. Thank you. Only when the heart is profused with blood from its new owner does it spontaneously start beating again. It is thought that this internal nervous system, or brain in the heart, is what allows a heart transplant to work. McCrady goes further. Certainly the function of the heart itself have got to be transplanted and go along. When you think of the heart, it's a very complex organ. All the coordination that has to happen within the heart for it to pump efficiently, and it, it really can't function properly and efficiently without the neural system in the, in the heart. Uh, but that's very clear. So that those types of functions have got to get transplanted. And there's certain types of memory there that the heart has to remember what it did last beat or a few beats ago to be able to, to function properly now. Boy, the heart started beating right away, didn't it? Pretty nice. If the heart has a nervous system and a type of memory needed for its efficient function, could higher level memories also be stored and transferred? And what would this tell us about where our memory resides? Memory itself is what's called distributed, a distributed process. And this has been known for many, many, many hundred years uh, now that you can't localize memory to a neuron or a group of neurons. The memory itself is distributed throughout the neural system. So why do we have to draw a line at the throat and say that memory is only distributed from here to here? Why couldn't it be distributed throughout the, the whole neural system? And if memory is distributed throughout the nervous system, including organs like the heart, what would this mean for transplant recipients? When you put a heart into a transplant, we could potentially retrieve some of those memories that were distributed throughout the whole system. Uh, I'm certainly not saying that is the explanation, but it's plausible that that could, could be what's going on. Some heart transplant recipients feel a change so profound they are battling with a complete transformation. Bill Wohl from Phoenix, Arizona had a heart transplant five years ago. His change after the operation was dramatic. I couldn't have been luckier because I got a fantastic donor, someone super healthy, handsome leading man, good looks, and uh, the fun began. Bill felt he was being driven by a completely new personality. Previously a successful and hard-working businessman, he put his career aside and began a new life. Dr. Jack Copeland was his transplant surgeon. Within months, the man was transformed into an athlete. Uh, we have very little idea that this was going to happen to him, but he, it did. He, he started cycling, he started working out, he started swimming. Just months after his operation, Bill began training excessively. But it wasn't until a full year later, when he met his donor family, that he found out that he had developed remarkable parallels to his donor. I know on certain things that I had no interest or whatever in before, it had to come from somewhere. And um, it makes sense to me, and I truly believe that it came from my donor. Brady, Bill's donor, was a Hollywood stuntman. Woo! It was only when Bill met his donor family that his new interests seemed to make sense. He is convinced that he has inherited many personality traits through his donor's heart. The researchers at the Institute of Heart Math set out to design an experiment to investigate the heart's role in processing emotional information. What we found was that the heart is by far the most accurate part of our body that reflects how we're feeling. Our heart is literally beating out different messages that is strongly correlated with our emotional state. It's a scientific fact, even though a lot of people don't know this, that the heart sends more information to the brain than the brain sends to the heart. It's very important to understand the relationship between the brain and the heart because this ultimately helps us understand how the heart can have memories related to the brain. The brain and the heart are interconnected by multiple sources of information. First of all, there's neural connection from the brain to the heart. 
there's also humoral connections. Okay, hormones will go from the brain to the heart. The heart, in turn, of course, sends feedback back to the brain through pressure receptors and through um, literally the blood going back. But then what's often not recognized is that the heart is the largest generator of electromagnetic signals in the body. In fact, the EKG is, is 10 to 100 times even larger than the EEG of the brain. And the electrical signal from the heart travels through the bloodstream to the brain. And of course, the brain's electrical signal travels back to the heart. So consequently, these two are sharing their interactions, even electromagnetically with each other. It's like a radio transmitter works. The heart radiates very strong fields, and the heart is the strongest rhythmic source of electromagnetic fields in the body. And with today's equipment, we can measure the magnetic field of the heart six feet away from the body. Uh, probably it goes farther, but that's the sensitivity of the equipment we have now. They began investigating the heart's role in our experience of feeling and emotion. Some of our more recent research, where we're looking at the, I call it the electrophysiology of intuition, are indicating that the heart really is connected to some other, I call it, field of information. In the experiment, subjects were shown photographs chosen to cause extreme emotions, both positive and negative. They were selected at six second intervals at random. They recorded the physiology of brain and heart activity. What we found is in that we, what we call pre-stimulus period before they saw the photograph, that both the heart and the brain would react differently. That the heart was shifting, it was changing, before the brain was. According to McCrady, the experiment shows that the heart is behaving intuitively. Remarkably, the heart registers an anticipatory response before a disturbing image appears on screen and sends a message directly to the emotional centers of the brain. The brain then prepares the body to take action. This was even a surprise to us. That the heart was plugged into this type of information even before the brain. Where all this leads, according to McCrady, is to a suggestion that the brain doesn't have an exclusive role in information processing. It's quite plausible then that if we transplant a heart from one person to another, that that transplanted heart is connected to a field, that field of information from the person that they got that heart from. And it feels like there's somebody else inside them. McCrady's theories are not accepted by mainstream medicine. But patients like Claire Sylvia are still searching for an explanation for what they feel. With new evidence that an organ like the heart could have its own unique type of intelligence, we are moving towards an understanding of how the heart, in collaboration with the brain, has a role to play in interpreting the world around us. The heart may be, based on current science, a sentient, thinking, feeling, remembering organ. That's the story. The transplant patients are the, some of the data. If that's true, then we ask the question, have we been thinking without a heart for all these years, or at least not as much with it as we should? If that's the case, we better wake up and have a heart. <laughs>